Welcome to this node breakdown for Mardini 2024 with Grayscale Gorilla. This is day 21, and today's node is the Vellum Configure Cloth node. So this is a sub-level geometry node, so we can drop a geometry node and dive inside. If we go ahead and search for Vellum Cloth, you'll see the Vellum Configure Cloth. An interesting thing to note about this node is that it's actually a preset of the Vellum Constraints node. So if we just go over to Vellum Constraints, you can see over here that if we change the constraint type to cloth, then we'll have access to all of the same settings that we do over on this one over here. Now, these settings are pre-configured for cloth, but it is the same node. So what exactly does this node do? In simplest terms, it just takes a particular geometry and turns it into cloth. So if we go ahead and create a grid, now do keep in mind this isn't the best way to do it and I'll be showing you better ways to do it, but I just want to show you how this works. So with a Vellum solver SOP, we can go ahead and plug these inputs into our solver. And if we go ahead and add a ground plane, we're just going to move it down to negative one, play this back and let's see what we have. So as you can see, this works. However, if you want the best type of deformation with your cloth constraints, you actually don't want quads. Generally, it's better to be working with triangles and you actually want triangles that are fairly evenly sized. To do this, you could use something like a remesh node. So if we take this grid into the remesh, then all you'd want to do is increase the iterations and perhaps decrease the target size and you end up with triangles that are fairly uniformly scaled. You plug that into the vellum cloth and let's play this back. And as you can see, you end up with more interesting results already. The type of folding that the cloth goes under is much more realistic because it has more axes to work along. Now, a better way to actually do this is to use a planar patch. A planar patch will actually just create a patch for us to use. So planar patch over here. You can see that it creates a rectangle, so much like the grid that we just remeshed, but this one already has triangles. You can see that there's other shapes that we can create with this, like a circle, and then we have options for things like edge length. So if I plug this into our vellum cloth, into our vellum solver, play it back, we just have this cloth that collapses. Now let's consider these three outputs from our vellum configure cloth. I'm going to drop three nulls and we can just go through them over here. So the first output is going to just be our cloth, right? This is basically just what's coming in. If we take a look at our attributes over here, you can see that it adds a few settings to it. Drag normal, drag tangent, mass, P scale, all of that, right? So that's being added. This is just going to be our geo. The second one over here is really important. These are our constraints. And this is something that's generated by our cloth. So if we take a look at this, you can see that it has things like compress stiffness. It has a constraint tag, a damping ratio, a rest length, an original rest length a stiffness and a type, as well as bend and stretch as two prim groups. The third one over here is just going to be your colliders. So if we don't have any colliders plugged in, then it won't show up. But if you had to plug a collider into third input of this vellum cloth, then it would get passed through into our vellum solver using this third output. So let's go back to the constraints because this is important. If we go to our vellum cloth, you'll see over here that we have some settings, right? We'll have things like mass over here and an edge length scale. And this over here for the mass is actually going to be applied to the geometry itself. So if we just take a look over here under the geometry, you can see that we have this mass over here. Moving on from there, we also have the normal drag and tangent drag. All of those things are applied to the actual geometry. When we get further down to this over here where we have stretch and we have bend, these are the constraints that are applied over here in this constraint network. So stretch is going to define how much the rest lengths can change. When I say rest length, I just mean the current length of a particular constraint. So you can see that each constraint has a length. This at the moment is its rest length. If this increases when a force is applied, then that suggests a stretchier fabric. If we go over here and look at the next one, we have bend. And bend stiffness is going to define how easily a constraint's angle can change. So the angle between two constraints, how easily can that change? And that's going to be your bend. Now you can also see that there are two different types, bend and stretch. So if I just use a split over here, these are our bend constraints. These are our stretch constraints. Now, generally, stretch stiffness will stay fairly high unless you want a material that is stretchy. But a lot of the time, you'll be working with bend. So let's just go ahead and take a look at this. So if we go over here and just change the stiffness of our bend, so we can rather use these quick presets over on the side, you'll see that we end up with something that looks a bit more rubbery, right? It resists bending. If we drop this back, you can see that it bends more easily. So the damping ratio over here is going to control how quickly your cloth comes to rest. So if we push this up to something like 0.2, you'll see less jitteriness in the cloth, right? So this also makes it appear less rubbery. It kind of kills out any sort of motion and lets the cloth come to rest very quickly. Additionally, we also have something called plasticity. So let's increase our stiffness to some very high amount and play it back. 
So you can see it's that very rubbery look, but when it falls back down, it's completely flat. If we enable plasticity, it's this idea that something can bend into a particular position and not necessarily come out of it. So if we just play around with these settings a bit, you'll see now we have this sort of situation where it doesn't return to being completely flat, it's now bent out of shape, right? So that's what plasticity is used for. So those are the main things that we'd probably want to look at. I just want to show you some other nodes that also use the cloth constraints. Interestingly, we also have vellum soft body. So the configure strut soft body uses a cloth and then defines some struts. You won't really see anything if we use something like a planar patch. So I'm going to go ahead and just use a sphere right over here. Change this to a polygon so that we have triangles. Increase the frequency to something like three. And then let's just plug that into our vellum cloth. And we can plug it into this same solver that we used before. Play this back and you'll see that there is some rigidity to this sphere. This is because of our vellum struts. If we go ahead and take a look at the constraints of this, so I'm going to grab our three nulls. We have the geo and then we have the constraints, but the constraints are both a cloth constraint and these internal strut constraints. So this one generates the basic cloth and so that's going to be this outside material. And then this over here creates some internal struts for us. Both of these are actually the same node. They're both just vellum constraints node, but this one is pre-configured for cloth and this one is pre-configured for struts. So it gives us this internal structure. And if we take a look at what that actually does for us, it stops our sphere from deforming. So once again, this is a network that you can make all sorts of changes to. The other node set that uses a vellum configure cloth is the vellum balloon. So if we go over here and configure balloon, you'll see that this one once again uses a cloth as well as a vellum pressure. So this one's a lot of fun to work with and I'm going to quickly make an example for you over here. So once again, I'm just going to use a sphere and then grab our vellum solver and just use this one over here. If we play this back, you'll see that it behaves similarly to the vellum struts. But what's happening here is that there's internal pressure. If we take a look at our constraints, there isn't that internal structure that we had before. This just mimics pressure. And this is interesting because we can actually affect the pressure. If we take a look at our constraints, once again, we have bend and stretch, but there's also this constraint tag. And this is going to come in handy for when you start working with vellum. If we take a look at our geometry spreadsheet, you'll see that it says vellum geometry, go to the constraint geometry and constraints carry all of their attributes on primitives. So just go over to primitives and you can see the values over here. You'll see that we have a constraint tag. Now the constraint tag is one way of working with it. You can see that various constraints have these different values, but we also have the type over here. So you can see that we have this one, which is pressure. So this is really useful to know because if we double click on our vellum solver, we can do this cool thing where we use a vellum properties. So vellum constraint properties, plug this in over here. And under group, all we have to do is say at type equals pressure, right? Just like that. And then we can adjust any one of these values as we'd like. So over here for rest length, I'm just gonna set this to zero and you'll see that the entire thing collapses down on itself. We can give this a more reasonable value. So something like 0 0.1, and you'll see that it just kind of collapses onto the floor over there. Or alternatively, you can give this a high value like two and it will inflate. The cool thing is this is completely keyframeable. So if we go over here and just set our rest length at frame one and then go over to frame 24 and push this up to two, then we can have it scale up over time. So if we play this back, you'll see that it increases in size. Additionally, a better way to often do this is to use the rest length scale because this acts as a multiplier of our rest length. So if we just go over here, and set it to zero and then move up to frame 24 and keyframe it over there and then start our inflation up to frame 48. You can take a look at what we have. So it collapses and then inflates. So you can play around with any of these settings. And if you want to be more involved with this, you can dive inside and you can actually use a SOP solver. So you can see it says SOP solver and SOP solver constraint geometry. This one over here runs over geometry. And so that's going to be your first input. The other one, so SOP solver constraint geometry runs over constraints. But I find an easy way to just use this is to go over to your SOP solver, so the regular one, and you can actually just change the data name over here to constraint geometry. We're also going to make the default operation to set always. Plug this in over here, plug first input in. And if we go inside of the SOP solver, you'll be able to see that we can actually affect our constraint geometry inside of here. And this works as a SOP geometry level, so you can do all sorts of things. For example, over here, I just have a file where I'm generating some spheres copying them to points, turning them to cloth, adding vellum pressure to them, collapsing them all using a rest length of zero, then using a vellum drape, which is a useful node for setting up an initial state for your simulation, where all you would do is go over, increase the time scale to one and freeze it at a particular frame. So that gives us a good input for our vellum solver over here. And inside of this, I've got the SOP solver. Over here, there's a sphere 
that moves over over time. And as it moves across, it transfers an attribute. So it's an inflation attribute. And I use it over here to affect the rest length, right? So you set your attribute wrangle to a type of primitives, set the group that you want to affect. So at type equals pressure and then affect the rest length based on this. And if we just go up a level, you can see what we have. So it's all of these that are collapsed on the floor. And as that sphere comes across, each one of these inflates over time. Right, so I'll include this down below for download. You can go through it and take a look at all of the things that I'm doing. So tomorrow we're going to be taking a look at the hair generation sub. And I'll see you there for that video. Bye.